Hello 3D animation students. We are going to learn in this lesson how to select the menu and icon sets within Maya, create a new scene view, <coughs> create 3D primitives, select and manipulate objects and components for editing, move and rotate objects using your mouse, change viewing panels in, in Maya for a variety of viewing methods, uh, undo actions that you um, might need to change. So uh, before beginning your work it's a good idea to set your project so that all the files are saved and referenced to one project folder. Maya needs to do this as you as you know. So this project folder and future project folders are going to be provided on D2L. Um, almost every unit has one of these. It's the demo files that we're going to be working on. And to put this, pro uh, put this project folder on your computer, um, just click on this arrow and go to Download. And this will do the same thing on a PC or a Mac. Um, the difference is on a PC, you have to do a little bit more. But either way, you can either right click on it or whatever and go to Show in Folder or Show in Finder. If you're on a Mac, when you double click this, it will just instantly um, unzip and make a folder for it. If you're on a PC, it will not do that. When you double click it, it'll do this. And you have to highlight that demo folder and copy it. And then that can go in your regular Maya folder, wherever that might be. So for me, it's in my documents folder. Maya projects and I'm going to right click and paste into that folder. So, And again, you don't have to do that if you're on Mac, just double clicking it will just instantly pull this folder out. And that's a compressed folder that um, once it uncompresses you'll have a full project folder uh, with scenes and whatever else might be necessary for that particular demo. So that's how that's going to work throughout um, the rest of the course. So um, I'm going to go back to Maya and I'm going to set my project to that folder that I just unzipped. So file set project and I put this right in my default projects folder so it's just right there. Um, if you have it somewhere else like your desktop or your downloads or whatever you'll have to navigate to that folder so that you can find it. So um, just highlight that and click set and then um, you can verify that you've got the right project folder set by clicking File, Open Scene, and you should see Building Primitives.ma. You should see up here the project folder that we just unzipped. Um, one of the things that's really useful with these project folders is this little um, collection of shortcuts to your project fol subfolders right here. And you can always jump back to the workspace root, the top folder for your project, and then go into the scenes folder or whatever it is you need, images, source images, whatever. And that will ensure that you're in your project folder. Because um, Maya will not warn you that you've navigated away from your project folder and you're opening stuff outside of your project folder or saving stuff, as the case may be. So. Um, never has and probably never will so it just expects you to know what you're doing um, so use these shortcuts you can just hit workspace root before you navigate to where you want to go and then from there you can go to the subfolders so um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do a file open scene and open the building primitives MA and I did not have any changes to save so uh, if any windows pop up on these on these demos which sometimes they do um, just don't worry about that just close them until you need them so um, you might see hypershade sometimes you might see outliner sometimes so um, this is here just as a reference for what you should expect to end up with when you're done with this tutorial you can see a table a couple of salt shakers an apple a banana and a weird funky bowl. So um, I love that crazy bowl. 
Okay, so um, we can go to layers and go ahead and turn off that visibility if, um, if that's distracting you. Um, just click the V on each layer here. And then I'll make a new layer that I'm going to work in. And I'll just call this um, Unit 2 Tutorial. Doesn't really matter what you call it. And you can give that a color label if you if you like. So whatever, whatever color you want. And this is just a normal display. And probably we want it visible. I don't like to work invisibly. And so there you go. Um, we're going to start with a NURB sphere. Uh, we want interactive creation off, so I'm going to go to create NURBS primitive and just verify that the interactive creation is not selected. And we're going to do some um, creation through the option boxes here, um, or just some of the defaults. So go to create NURBS primitives sphere. You can also use your shelf under curves and surfaces. This will do the exact same thing as create NURBS primitives sphere and there's my sphere. I'm going to press F to frame it. Uh, actually I'm going to press Shift F to frame it in all views and that will center it and zoom me in. Uh, that does that for whatever you're, you have selected. Uh, press 5 to show shaded mode. It's probably already on most of the time it is, so um, in my top left view here you can see it's in wireframe mode. And if I press 5 when I'm pointing at the top, it'll change that to shaded mode. 4 changes it back to wireframe mode. And that does not do anything to your image. It doesn't change what it looks like in any way. Remember, your real image is the render. So you can see there's no change, whether it's shown as shaded or not. That is just a workspace thing. So um, everything you see in the workspace, if it, if it looks wrong uh, in one way or another, which can happen sometimes, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter in the workspace. What matters is the render. So. We're going to reshape the sphere a little bit by editing the individual components and modifying the control vertex positions. I am going to press F8 to go into component mode. Um, if you have a Mac and you press F8, if you have not remapped your keys, what it's going to do is start iTunes. It won't do this. It will. It, you'll see iTunes launch. Um, since I have a PC, it's not going to do that. Uh, if you um, want to fix that, you have to go into System Preferences, and you have to go into the Keyboard Preferences, and you will see under one of the tabs there, Use All Function Keys as Standard F1, F2, etc. And you want to toggle that on. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you can always just, instead of clicking F8, you can always just go up here and switch between component and object mode that way. It does the same thing either way, whether you press F8 or use this little selection. So um, that's how you get into component mode. And you can see we've got these dots here. Um, I'm going to show you the same thing just as a different way of viewing it. If you right click on it, and go to Hull. Uh, what it does is it just draws lines between all those dots. So that might make it a little easier for you to see the CVs. And then what I want to do is I want to select the top row of CVs with it. That's just short for control vertex um, with the mouse. So I can just marquee over that. And I got, yeah, I got a weird selection. I wonder if 
my soft selection is still on. Nope, that's not it. Okay, I got a funky selection here. Let's... I'm going to try just control deselecting these. Not sure why it made me do that, but I just deselected every other point by control dragging. So now I've just got these. Um, so that works. And I can kind of push the top down and get this sort of indentation to get my apple started. And I'm going to switch it back to regular control vertex because I don't think it'll make me do that. I'm going to do just a little indentation on the bottom as well. Not too much, just you know how much you want to do is up to you. You can even select the center point if you want to and Oh, no, never mind. Forget I said that. So you can have a bigger indentation or a smaller indentation. If you want kind of an oblong apple, you can pull it down. So just to give you the idea that you can start shaping your, your primitive objects here um, to, to a little bit of a degree. So the apple needs a stem now. Uh, we can do that very simply with a NURB cylinder. We're just going to tack a NURB cylinder into it and uh, basically squish it right in the center there. So to get a NURB cylinder, um, you can go here or you can do the create, uh, but we're going to use the option box. So this won't give you the option box. You'll have to edit it after you click here. Um, it'll still work, but I want to go to create cylinder option box and when we open these option boxes from here on out uh, just until you really get a handle on what you're doing I want you to plan on going to reset settings every time just click edit reset settings whenever you open an option box uh, and I'll explain that later but um, for now just just do it um, so I'm going to set cap to top so that it closes off the top of it. We don't need it closed on the bottom because that will be stuck in the apple. And we can click create. Again, the only difference between create and apply, they both do the exact same thing except that create closes the option box. Apply does not close the option box. Now I'm going to take this stem, which right now is more of a 55 gallon drum, and I'm going to press R to scale that down. And then on the either the front or the side view, doesn't matter which, I'm going to scale it up in the Y direction. So, and that looks a little thick for a stem still, so I'm going to scale it down a little further until I've got a nice thin stem and then scale the Y. And then I'm going to press W to use the move tool and I'm going to pull it up to translate Y to this number doesn't need to be exactly the same but just to where it sticks out of the stem, uh, sticks out of the apple to some degree. So. Um, I'm going to select that stem and I'm going to grab the top row of control vertice vertices and I'm going to use E to rotate. These are all my QWERTY tools that I'm doing the, the move with the W, the E to rotate, the R to scale. So um, I'm going to do an E to rotate and just rotate it to the side a little bit and then move it. A little to the side so it gives it a little bit of a bend. Okay, now I'll press F8 or click up here, sorry, right there to go back to object mode. Since you will move the stem and the apple as one, 
uh, we are going to want to group them together. So um, select the stem and then shift select the apple body and let's name these. I want to try to get you in the habit of naming everything because NURB Cylinder 1, I mean if, if you've got two objects in your scene, no it doesn't matter that much, but if you've got a thousand objects in your scene, this is going to be a problem and um, if you're not in the habit of naming them when you start to get to your big epic scenes, you're going to give yourself so many more headaches than, than you need, than you're already going to have just because it's Maya. So let's name these. Let's just plan on naming everything. I'm going to click on NURB Cylinder 1 right here, and this is not the only place you can name it, but up here in the channel box, I'm just going to click STEM. So, And by the way, if you're not seeing the channel box, there the tabs are right here. So you might be seeing the attribute editor or the modeling toolkit. I'm sticking to the channel box right now and, um, and layer editor. So this is now renamed something more sensible. I'm going to select the sphere and I'm going to rename this apple body. And uh, it doesn't really matter what order you select these in, but I will select the stem and then shift select the apple. And I can press control G on PC or command G on um, Mac to group them, or I can click edit group. Either way is fine. And then I'm going to rename this group. Apple all. So, and when you're making these names, remember alphanumeric um, only underscore is okay. I wouldn't try to use any other characters. I think Maya these days is a lot more forgiving. It probably won't get too mad at you if you use characters that it doesn't like. It'll probably just change it to an underscore or something like that. So, uh, but alphanumeric uh, and underscore are all you need for these for these naming conventions. So um, let's do a save scene as. We're going to save this as a different name than what we started with. And I'm going to call this um, Your Name Primitives. It doesn't really matter. You're not turning this in. This is just for learning purposes. And again, I just will reiterate, I recommend switching the file type to Maya ASCII. And then click Save As. So that just makes this project now saved as my own file right up here. You can see that. So um, remember to save often. So let's create a banana. Let's get this apple out of the way because we're going to be using the space here. So just move it somewhere else for a moment and let's create a banana um, we're gonna do we're gonna start with a NURB sphere we're gonna kinda squash it down to a cigar and go from there so create NURBS primitives sphere um, are we doing option box yes uh, okay and we are going to put the axis in the z-axis that'll change where the poles of the sphere are. Oh, and be sure to reset settings before you do that. So edit reset settings and then click Z on the z-axis and create. scale on the z-axis by 6. Um, you can do that again by using the R key and you can just pull it along the z-axis here until it gets to about 6 or you can just click on the channel box and do this numerically so that's another way to scale, rotate, and translate is right up here you can type the numbers in. So I'm going to scale that on the z-axis by a factor of 6 and that gives me a cigar kind of shape. <clears throat> um, so now we need to modify the shape. 
uh, I'm going to go to component mode, um, CV mode specifically. Uh, you can press F8 and that will work. You can right click on it, press CV. You can click up here, it'll all work. And I want to select the control vertices on the ends of the apple. Basically, everything, <coughs> every control vertex except the ones down the center. So I'm going to select these and then I'm going to press, you can press shift, control to add to the selection, shift control at the same time. Uh, if you just press shift that works too because it just toggles the selection. If it's off it'll turn it on, if it's on it'll turn it off. Um, it might be easier to use control shift and control so you can see the plus and minus there you know. Um, while you're learning Maya, you're adding to your selection with control shift. You're subtracting from your selection with just control. Uh, but it works the same, just the same. So you can always just start a selection, shift select, however you want to do it, just as long as you're understanding what's going on. That's what's important. And then I'll turn on my move tool with W and just pull these up. Now because this is NURBS, these vertices don't have straight lines between each other. They have curvy lines. Same with the apple. If this were polygons, it wouldn't be doing this curve. It would be straight lines between the um, between the vert vert vertices. I'm sorry. Uh, we need another um, small clump of vertices on the end here so we can pinch the end off for the stem of the banana. Uh, either end is fine, it doesn't matter. I'll just I'll use the left side, but it doesn't really matter. Um, we're going to go F8 to go back to object mode, and we'll do this in perspective view. Um, this is a way of adding geometry to your to your model. This is a way of, in a sense, adding resolution to your model, so um, so that you can work with it later. This is kind of a lumpy end here, and that's not really what a banana looks like right now. It's more of a chili pepper. So um, we'll just add a set of vertices right along the edge here, and then use that to compress it down. So. You're in object mode. You know you're in object mode because the outlines are green. Right click on the banana and select isoparm from the pop-up menu. And you want to click on the existing isoparm to select it and then click drag until the yellow isoparm sits near the original. So just just a little offset there and then when you let up it will give you this dotted line and that will um, indicate where this new geometry is going to appear. It's kind of like a cut. So from there um, if you're in the modeling menu uh, if you're not in the modeling menu, switch to the modeling menu. From the modeling menu, go to surfaces, uh, insert isoparms right down here. And now we have a new set of control vertices that will create uh, that extra resolution we need to make this stem. So the, the control vertices don't appear right on the line. The reason for that is because this is NURBS, not polygons. NURBS are doing um, splines between one point to the next. It's different than polygons. So it's um, if you're familiar with Bezier curves, um, if you're into the pen tool, NURBS will be your friend. Now if I select that new little um, ring of vertices and just scale it down, I'll have 
more of a compacted stem. And I want to also move it back in the Z space a little bit, just a touch, maybe down a little bit just to straighten it out if you want to. Um, you know, however you want to shape it here is fine. So you can have a real long stem or more of a little stem, however you want to do it. So this is a very common type of uh, modeling procedure is adding geometry, tweaking the vertices, making more cuts, adding more geometry, uh, eventually getting into extrusions and um, lofts and things of that nature to actually create more geometry. Um, this is kind of the standard 3D modeling procedure um, outside of the sculpture type of softwares like Mudbox and ZBrush, which are a little different. They act more in an organic um, kind of fashion. So just try to get used to this. This is what you'll be doing. So let's go back to object mode. And we're going to name this banana. And we can save the scene now. It's a good idea to save on every step, of course. And I'm going to get that banana out of the way. I'm going to move it over by the apple. And this is just one object, so it doesn't really need to be grouped or anything like that. So, And if you're in object mode, by the way, you need to know about selecting groups. Let me take just a little sidetrack and then we'll create the funky bowl. The, um, the object selection mode does not select a group. A group is not an object. Um, it does not select parents. So um, a group and parents are very close to the same thing. They're not exactly the same thing, but they're close. Now this is going to be a little hard to get your head around at first, but once you understand hierarchies you will get this. If you've got it on object mode and you drag a marquee around your grouped objects, you're going to have a weird problem. And the weird problem is going to be that for every unit that you translate, it's going to go two. The reason that it's doing that is because if you open your outliner, you'll see that you've got the group nodes selected as well as, or in, in the case of parents, the parent nodes selected, as well as all of its children. So when I move things like that, if I translate it one unit, I get two. Why? Why does that happen? That happens because the children are inheriting the attributes of the parent. So I've got the parent selected, I move that one unit, the children, which are stem and apple body, inherit the one unit of movement from the apple all parent node. But I also have the stem and the apple body selected, and I'm moving them one unit as well for a total of two units. See? So in addition to its inheritance of one unit, it's moving its own unit. So it totals out to two. That's really, really weird for new students before you start understanding the hierarchy. Um, so I'm going to undo that. And what I want to do is just select the group. I don't want to select everything in it. I just want the group. And then my, my movements and my rotations and anything else will work normally. So when you're selecting groups or hierarchies, you probably want to use the outliner. And um, depending on how they're intended to work, um, just make sure you've got the right selection. In, in the case of the Apple, it's going to all move together, so you just want to select the Apple All node and nothing else. So um, I just wanted to lay that out there. I'm not expecting everyone will entirely understand that right away, um, but as we continue to learn about how nodes and hierarchies work, it will become more apparent why that is.
Okay, so the funky bowl. Um, we're going to create a bowl for the fruit to sit in, made from a NURBS sphere. Uh, modif I'm sorry, torus. Modified NURBS torus. We're going to create the torus, create NURBS primitive torus, and I'm going to skip the option box in this case. I'll press Shift F to frame that up in all views. And I actually want to <clears throat> um, change the attributes in the channel box. Um, well, I, and then I actually want to change the creation attributes. But the basic attributes, um, XYZ scale is going to be 5. So I'm going to do 5 all around right up here. And then I want to go to the make input, uh, the make NURBS torus, which is the input node. And this gives me the options basically the same as the option box. Um, so I'm just showing a different way of doing the same thing. <clears throat> I'm going to set the height ratio to 0.8 which will change the shape of the torus a little bit, make it a little bit fatter. And then the minor sweep, I'm going to change to 250. The minor sweep is the circle that defines the cross section of this bowl. And now you can see it's upside down, so I want to change the rotate x to 180 degrees to flip it over. And I don't think we renamed the banana. Let's rename NURBS Taurus 1. Let's rename that bowl. And I want to select the banana. I did rename the banana. Okay, good. Sometimes I forget. Now let's move that out of the way. And let's create polygon primitives cylinder. And oops, we should have changed some of the options before we did that. We should have opened the option box. Well, easy enough to fix. So we're going to go to the um, channel box and under the input node, this is the creation node, we're going to change the subdivisions along the axis to 8. And we're going to rename this shaker body. And what we want to do is seems like this should be taller. Let me check something real quick. Huh. Seems like this should be taller. Um, I'm going to scale this up a little bit because let me check how it scales to the rest of the scene. Okay, actually, I'm going to scale it down a little bit. I'm going to give it a half scale in the um, Z and X axis, so let's do a 0.5 and a 0.5 so that relative to the rest of the scene it's what we want. Okay, that looks better. If you ended up with a fat salt shaker it doesn't really matter, but I just figured I'd make it look a little more like the pictures in the tutorial. So I'm going to right click on the shaker body object and select vertex. So the vertices on a polygon object function differently than a NURBS object. 
basically being that they will draw a straight line from one vertex to the next instead of a Bezier curve. So I'm going to press R to scale and then I want to scale these down proportionally to get a taper on the body like that. <clears throat> so let's create a top for it. Polygon sphere option box and we're gonna click edit reset settings and click create and we'll call this cap and I'm gonna scale this down and um, move it up in the y-axis to where the center of it is just about flush with the top of that salt shaker. And then I'm going to scale it down until it's just about enveloped by the top of the salt shaker. Just like that. So that's... Um, fine, everything is good. We've named it cap. Uh, we're going to shift select shaker body and press control G to group those items together. And we're going to rename the group shaker. And <clears throat> I'm going to keep that selection and create a duplicate. So click Edit, Duplicate. And it will duplicate the second object directly in the same space as the first object. So it won't look like anything happened, although you'll notice like some of the lines might have become sort of dashed lines, but it sort of doesn't look like anything happened. Uh, we can verify that something happened in the hypergraph or in the outliner. So you can see here I've got now a shaker one, shaker two, or I'm sorry, shaker and shaker one. Two shakers at any rate. Um, and if I go to window, general editors, hypergraph hierarchy, this again shows kind of the same thing in a different way so you can also select with with this window so um, shaker cap shaker body as children and then shaker one cap and shaker body as children so with that verified that I do in fact have two objects if I go ahead and grab one of those and move it once it's not in the same space it will become visually obvious that there are, in fact, two objects there. Again, make sure you are being very careful about what you select, or you may be unhappy with the results. It can be very easy to get confused about your selections in Maya. These actually didn't come out the exact same shape as they did in the tutorial. Maybe I wasn't supposed to squish them, but whatever, it doesn't matter, you get the idea. So I'm going to shift select the other shaker group and just move that somewhere that it's out of my face. And next up is the table that this stuff will be resting on. So this is pretty easy to create as well. Um, we're going to start with a really primitive table, just a uh, polygon primitive cube, and then go to the option box right here, and let's do a reset settings. So, and that's why you want to reset settings. You'll notice that there were some settings 
that were stored there before I typed anything in, and that can really um, make things a little problematic. So we're going to do, uh, on the scale, we're going to do We're going to do create first, and then on the scale x, we're going to do 32 and 25 in the scale z. And some of our stuff is a little in the way. If it's it can become visually difficult to edit objects if they start to occupy the same space. So again, make friends with the outliner um, or any other method that you like. I think I lost a little piece of something over there. Yep, I did. I selected the apple in exactly the way I told you not to. Ah, look at that. See what happens? So I undid that and then I selected apple all instead. And now I will move it along with the stem. And the shaker 1 and shaker 2 are a little close also, so I'll just get them all over there. Okay, so frame that up. Shift F to frame it in all views. Now this is, um, you're going to do a better table than this in the next unit. So um, a, a lot of these polygon primitives, um, they're fine to start with, but eventually they start looking pretty bad. Those hard edges just have a nasty kind of look to them. So you're going to learn how to do some stuff with the edges through things like extruding and um, lofting and stuff like that, like I said earlier. So let's make the table legs. We're going to create polygon primitive cylinder. Uh, in the channel box, we are going to select the poly cylinder input node right here. Set the radius to 0.8. and the height to 25, subdivision height to 5. That, you may have noticed, created some more geometry along, along its length. And uh, if you weren't already, go to the four panel layout and we're going to move this down so that it's you can have a little bit of the top of the leg sticking inside the table if you want to. You don't have to try to get it precisely on the same line as the bottom of the table. So don't worry about that. Um, that's the table. Oh, I was thinking that was the line. That was the table. This is the table. So if the other objects are confusing, you can select objects and press Control h to hide just get them out of the out of the view to isolate what you're working on. You can do that anytime and then unhide. Um, I thought that was shift H. Let's see. Oh, okay. Apparently it has no key assigned to it, interestingly enough. Display show all will bring will bring your objects back. I was thinking that it was shift H, but that's not it. So I will hide these just to get them out of my face and move this up just a tad. And then I'm going to do a little bit of shaping on the... Um, 
on the table leg. I'm going to do this in, uh, it doesn't matter whether you do this in the front or the side view for the selection, but what I want to do is um, make a selection and push these, these vertices so that I can kind of create a, a sort of um, lathed looks to it, a sort of beveled look. If you know woodworking, if you have a lathe, you can create kind of a kind of a carving. Um, so if I push these vertices kind of close together, so I've got two rows here and here, I can select those two rows. If they're not exactly the same, it doesn't matter too much, but I'm going to try to get them kind of close. And don't move them. Okay, and then I'll go back to my four view and go to the top view now. I'm just using the space bar to maximize that, so I'll just use the space bar from now on. I'm going to press R to scale. And I'm doing this in the top view because I only want to scale the, um, the Z and the X axis. I don't want to scale it down in the Y. So press space bar to look again, and I've got this kind of... Oh, it did scale down in the Y. Okay, I'm going to undo that. I think it's because I selected the center instead of this handle. So if you select the center, it does all three axes. If you select this handle, it just does the two that are next to it. So this will do the, the X and the Y. And I can take that down a little bit. Go back to object mode and frame it up. And I've got this sort of lathed wood effect. That might be a little too harsh on the scale, so maybe I'll take it up a little bit more. It doesn't really matter though, I, as long as you get the idea. So it gives the, the cylinder a little more shape like somebody carved it um, as a table leg. Um, so again, still pretty primitive, but you're kind of moving stuff around. Now a table is not going to stand with one leg in the center. So I'm going to move this to the corner. And then I'm going to press Control D to duplicate. And again, that's, that's only going to be apparent in your outliner or whatever, so um, you have to just trust that it's there until you move it. I'll move this table leg to about the same spot on the other side, and then I'm going to shift select the first table leg, and I'm going to press Control D again, and then I'm going to move. So I've got the two at once now, and I'm going to move those right over here. Okay, and now drag a marquee over all of it. Oh, wait a second. Let's name these objects. Leg one. I should have done this before I duplicated them so that they they would just automatically be leg one, two, three, four. Leg two. Leg three. Leg four. And the P-cube, I'm going to name Tabletop. So, again, we're making sure we're naming everything. And let's go ahead and drag a selection around that. And Control-G to group it. And for the group name, we'll just call that Table. In this scene, there was already an, uh, another group called Table. So it just added a 1 next to that so that it doesn't conflict because these names can't repeat. So you'll notice there's that happens, you know, first of all, if you duplicate something, or second of all, if you name something uh, as a name that already exists. And do a file save or control S. And let's 
do a do a composition now. And if you want to, you can turn the visibility of the reference layers back on to give you give you a look at the composition that's there. And we've got a few objects hidden right now, so I'm going to go to display show all so that those come back. Um, I'm going to select the table and again use for, since it's a grouped object, use the outliner um, and we'll move that to wherever you want it. If you want to level it with the other table that's fine. If not, it doesn't matter. The bowl is just its own object, so I'm going to move that to the table and I'm going to do this in four views. It kind of helps to see the uh, side views sometime. You can see that the objects do not have any type of collision detection. It will let you push one object right through another. So um, you want to get it as close as possible to the table without the table going through. So that, that'll be pretty good. I'll bring the banana over and put it kind of sitting in the bowl, maybe give it a little rotation. The salt shakers are going to come on over here and we'll put them on the table here. That's a little bit regular with the placement, so I'm just going to move one over a little bit. So, and that just leaves the apple. The apple all, let's go ahead and put that in the bowl. And I think maybe the apple could be a little bigger, just a touch. Maybe one and a half times or somewhere in that ballpark. And... That works pretty good. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with it. So let's go ahead and make the objects um, colored. I'm going to select the select the banana and I'm going to right click apply or I'm sorry assign new material. And uh, I know the tutorial says blend, but um, now I'm disagreeing with myself. I think maybe Fong would be a better choice for the banana. So I'm going to do Fong. And we can go back to the Hypershade now, Rendering Editors. I'm sorry, Windows, Rendering Editors, Hypershade. And move it or resize it so that you can see a little bit of the window there. And I need to find the one I just created, which I think is probably Fong 1, I'm guessing. Let's see. Yep, that's Fong 1. Okay. So I'm going to make it, that's a little bit off what I want. I want just a little bit of orange in my yellow. And uh, again, please don't pick the 100% saturation. 100% brightness on every color you make. You can tone it down just a little and then use those pumped up colors for emphasis. And then let's rename this banana. Um, specular, I'm going to... The specular on a banana is there, but it's not really that prominent. So I'm going to take it down to a dark gray. Um, I'm going to make the reflectivity zero. It doesn't reflect anything. And the cosine power is just kind of, if the cosine power is low, it flattens the, the specular highlight out. If it's high, it makes a really hot, small specular highlight. So um, on a banana, that's going to be pretty low. So the numbers I am choosing are just arbitrary. There is no formula 
um, that I know. I mean, maybe somebody somewhere has a formula, but I, I don't know of any formula. I don't subscribe to any formula. I just tweak the settings with an idea of what they do until I get the look I want. So, um, and I'll do one more. Let's do the funky bowl. And let's right click on that, assign new material, fong. You can use the attribute editor to change your materials too. It doesn't have to be the hypershade window. So just like all the other software you use in, in the art program, there's many different ways to do the same thing. So let's call this porcelain bowl, pork bowl, there you go. And I'm going to make this color uh, pretty high key off white, a little bit in the orange range, just the slightest bit off white. So it's a little bit of an ivory color. And we'll take the... Um, We'll take the diffuse down just a tad. That's the overall light that it reflects. We'll learn all this in, in Unit 5 and 6, so don't worry about this too much. I'm just playing around here. Um, cosine power, I'm going to pump it up a little bit and bring up the specular color as well. Reflectivity, this, this setting actually doesn't matter because we're not going to turn on ray tracing. So. Um, you might as well just turn reflectivity off. So let's do a file save. And remember to compose your scene in the camera. So it's so you've got a nice shot. Don't just leave it floating out in space. Um, right now I don't have any environment for this. Uh, but uh, that's not the purpose of this demo. So when you're doing this, you have to have an environment. So there it is with the... Um, bowl and the banana, and it looks like the bowl is pushing through the table just a tiny bit. I can see the table coming through here, but that would just be easy to fix by pulling up the, the bowl just a tad. So um, that's it for this lesson. Um, tune in for part two, where we will create a temple out of primitives. create a temple out of primitives.